Thank you very much, Andy, like always. Thank you very much. Um, if you're new, uh, this is the first time you're seeing this, or if you've been continuous, understand that the purpose of this is really kind of from one presentation on to really build onto the next one. Uh, so I'm gonna have a few slides that are just gonna review just to make sure everyone's on the same page. But basically, today we're really going to talk about basic, basic pathology and then common incidental findings. Um, so, you know, I hope we all have a good idea, you know, after this of, you know, the common incidental findings or, or common findings that you're going to see in a cone beam volume when you navigate it, uh, as well as I'm not going to have really a slide on the variation of anatomy, but just to understand uh, a variation of anatomy is something that's still going to look basically normal, but might be bilateral versus an abnormality is something now you'll note in the back of your mind is something different. And as we go, you know, progress through our, um, you know, our description, impression, and differential, we'll find out if that's still just abnormality, something not to be concerned with, or pathosis with something that might, you might want to act, uh, you know, act on. Um, you know, in, in the description of today's course, you know, I was really hoping to have some cyst and tumor review. I'm going to touch on it, uh, but there's, I, I ended up having so much information just for these incidental findings, just so when you go through a volume, you know, these findings that you're going to see is all of a sudden you're going to note in the back of your mind, this is something I don't need to refer or not. And, and I was surprised of how much there actually is. So again, I'm going to touch on it, but next session, we're really going to go deep into the cysts and tumors. Again, to keep everybody on the same page, um, you know, once you take a scan, this is the multiplanar view you're going to have. You're going to have your axial, coronal, and sagittal. So your axial is parallel to the floor. Your coronal is going to be parallel to the front of the face, going front and back. And then your sagittal is going to be left and right. So basically your mid-sagittal mid line is right in, in the center, and then going left and right from there. The beautiful part of dentistry and, of course, cone beam CT uh, is that we have the capability to now do what's called modified views or modified slices. So we don't have to be stuck with that perfect parallel to the floor view on the axial. We can manipulate that view so that we can look right down, you know, the, 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 right down the barrel of an of a endodontally treated tooth or, or a canal. Uh, and you have to remember, you know, this is really crucial, especially for dentists. We're looking at you know, uh, different views, especially like the condyles or the airway. And the condyles, you have to imagine, they're not perfectly anterior posterior, they're slightly tilted in. And so these views really help and the manipulation of them uh, help us with our diagnosis. I still do consider the reconstructed panoramic the gold standard. Um, from this, this is what all of us are used to. Um, you know, we can see the sinuses, you can see, you know, general idea of the condyles, you see all the dentition, you can see that avular ridge, and then all the tooth bearing areas. And, you know, this, this is still what I consider the gold standard. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to admit, and this was, you know, early when I first started practicing out of, of, out of uh, radiology school is, you know, I was given a report or given a case, then to see something in the right mandible. And I look axial, sagittal, coronal, I don't see anything. Slightly irregular trabecular bone pattern, but nothing out of this extraordinary, no interruption of the cortical outlines. I do the re uh, reconstructed panoramic, and this is what he saw on the, his original panel, uh, and it translated perfectly with the, the cone beam CT. All of a sudden, you see this large, low density all around the ramus. And uh, ended up, you know, you know, getting referral, you know, definitely was something to be concerned with, not something just to be passing off. And uh, I, I, I can't clearly remember, but I'm 90% sure it was the MRI they got, uh, and it ended up being uh, AD malformation, atrial ventricular malformation. So, you know, the, the crossing of uh, the arterioles and the ventricular system. Uh, and, and from there, you, you know, after seeing a lesion like that and having an idea of what it was, and that was our first differential is, you know, not to take a biopsy because that, that patient would have bled out right there in the operatory. You know, you know, that's where, you know, radiology really, you know, helps you. I constantly go over this systematic approach and it is the best description of it. But the more times you go through a volume and the more times you go through a volume in a specific way that you're comfortable with, the more efficient and the faster you will be looking at these volumes. But always keep everything the same, you know, if you're looking at the condyles first, look at the condyles, then look at the airway, then look at the, the sinuses, 
look at the, the bony structures around the orbit and, and the nasal cavity, and then always look at the dentition last. And of course, your area of interest or you know uh, the, the, the main purpose, the patient's there, that should be the last thing you look at. Because what's going to happen, and I don't want to say we're all guilty of it, I'm definitely guilty of it, but you, you do what's called tunnel vision. You know, once you go to that area, you're going to forget about everything else. And once you develop that technique, it, you'll be surprised how quickly you can go through these volumes. Again, just touching on this, I'm not going to go into depth, but you know, to get a differential diagnosis, and it's no longer at that point, especially with cone and CT and the information that's available to us, that we look at a lesion and we say, hey, this is what it is. You know, you should always have a differential. And to get there, you should have a good description, leading that description to interpret as the impression and your diagnosis. And again, I'm not going to go in depth. I added this to the power to yeah the the the, uh, the PDF for uh, a handout because this is something I'm not saying for every case. Maybe for the next ten cases, just have that next to you when you're you're going through a volume and you see something unusual. Use this systematic approach. Use these items to kind of have an idea of what it is. And I can guarantee you, after ten times, you'll never have to look at that sheet of paper again, and you'll give yourself a really good description in your mind what it might be, which is going to lead you to, you know, of course, the correct diagnosis. But internal structure, uh, that's going to be your high density, low density, radiopaque, radiolucent, mixed density. Uh, the periphery, that's going to be your cortication or non-corticated is the regular borders. The shape, is it round or also irregular? Does it have, like some lesions have what's called a chevron shape? Um, you know, is it bilateral, uh, unilateral? Uh, extension is very important, but of course, the key one that you want to be looking at is what's the effect on the surrounding structures? Um, is there resorption of the teeth? Uh, is there tooth displacement? And we discussed this last week. You know, teeth that are being displaced and there's something in, in, in the, between them, this is where you're going to start thinking something that's tumoral or I should say, um, you know, a benign neoplasm. Uh, and of course, you know, cortical expansion, same thing, more, more neoplasm. And then is there interruption of those cortical outlines? And that's all, you know, all that whole description is going to lead you towards, you know, what you're going to find. So basically, you know, common abnormalities and incidental findings, there's too much to even put on, you know, 10 PowerPoint slides, you know, to go through it. There's so many different areas of a uh, person's head and neck that might be calcified that is just abnormal and not considered pathosis or something that's pathological. Uh, but there's, we're going to go over a few calcifications today. Peripheral lesions, I'm going to consider this a, just a common abnormality. Even cysts is there, you know, basic cysts, of apical cysts. Uh, I'm going to include it today because, it's, it's, again, it's, it's a very common finding. And, you know, even if it's not the area of interest, uh, I'm going to show you some images that's going to give you an idea of if it's something bad or, or not or something that should be acted on or not. But of course, your peripheral periodontitis, which is going to lead to your abscess. Now pus is being formed. And from there, an abscess is going to lead to granuloma or a cyst. And as I discussed, a cyst is something that's going to have an epithelial lining. So this is something that most likely, because now the epithelial lining is creating the, 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 the pus, no longer the necrotic tissue within a canal. So most likely, you're going to have to curatage that epithelial lining out before that tooth or that area uh, of the tooth is going to be healed. Uh, perinasal sinus and nasal cavity pretty much go hand in hand. You know, very common findings. We're going to look at a few there. Temporal mandibular joints, you know, everything from remodeling to, T, uh, to, uh, um, to DJD uh, fractures. We're going to cover a few items of that, and that goes hand in hand because uh, you got to imagine cervical vertebrae, like a, uh, the TMJ, temporal mandibular joints. Uh, there's a disc, and there's articular surfaces. So you're going to have similar findings. All right, so here, All right, here's some examples of peripheral lesions. Okay. So this first one. All right. This is not this is not quiz. You don't have to write anything down, but you know, just kind of follow me with this and and, and how the, the thought process is, is is something is, you know, something that you need to act on or something that you can kind of just leave alone and, and follow up on it. But here we got a you know, slight widening of the periodontal ligament space. Some might say there's a periodontal scar. Some might say missed root canal. 
or Miss Canal, I, I should say, but the very, the image next to it is along the long axis of the canal, and you can see that's very centric. So most likely there's no secondary canal here. You know, you'd be surprised if a filling material is not perfectly in the center, and even though you can't see that canal, most likely there's gonna be a second canal. In this case, it's, it's right down the center. So it looks really good. I don't know when this endodontic treatment was, was uh, completed, but let's assume it was completed a while ago. The big clue here that it is something pathological and something that should be treated is look at that periodontal bone loss. This is something that should be treated, most likely. On the other hand, here we have two low density areas that are very well corticated. And the giveaway of this, this is something that needs to be treated, is of course there's, it's not been endodontically treated. So this, this is the other extreme. On number seven here, this is a total different patient. Um, here we have low density area, very well corticated, so the body's trying to protect it, but that's, that's pretty large. Uh, the second point is, look how large that filling material is. Um, it's very wide, so it looks like this is, again, you know, I, I only get snapshots in time, and you might get the same thing. You might have a patient that's, you know, here for the first time, they have no records, they just moved from another city, they have no records of their previous dental history, and so this is what you see. And, you know, use your detective work to kind of discover what it is when it comes to periodical lesions. There's definitely something going on with this one. You know, something not to follow up on, but, you know, to, to refer or if you're endodontist, you, you know, you, you make the decision on what to do here. This final one, number 10, this is really what I want to point out because, again, I can only, in a report, and, and you're going to do the same thing, is a, not, a, I shouldn't say assume. You have to do your detective work and kind of use the clues that are given to you to get a diagnosis. This one, filling material reaches the apex. You can see the cortical, you know, there, there's widened periodontal ligament space, but it's very, very well corticated, almost a little sclerotic. So this is very, very long standing. So this, to me, I, I would call this a periapical scar anytime you show this to me. There's no way I would call this, you know, something, a pathosis or something pathological. Uh, so, you know, in a description, number 10, periapical scar, follow up in six months or a year, you know, uh, uh, with a periapical film to assess if there's any significant changes. And from there, you know, if, if it starts getting larger, then you know, you know, maybe retreatment, some, some other uh, 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 treatment might be necessary. But at this point, uh, especially if you did do that filling, it, it's, it's beautiful. You know, nothing, nothing's going to happen there. All right, so this is our first time using the pole system. And so this one, what I'm going to do for each of these, well, most of them, some of them, the second I say something, it'll give away the answer. So this one I'm going to describe to you and you pick what you think it might be. So this one is corticated, uh, sorry, it's not corticated, I'm sorry. It's cortical bone density. It's I said, the density of that bone, you know, you don't, you can call it high density if you want, but to have a perfect description, it's isodense or, you know, similar density to the cortical bone. It's slightly round. It's associated with the buccal cortical plate. And we know it's the buccal cortical plate because that's where the mental foramen, you know, comes out. Um, it's associated with the superior border of the mental foramen. Uh, it's, uh, or sorry, it's, it's associated with the mental foramen and the superior border. Oh. I don't know why that skipped. Um, superior border of the mandibular canal. This surrounding trabecular bone pattern looks normal. All right, let's see where we're at. 52% idiopathic osteosclerosis, osteodysplasia, osteoma, cementoblastoma. Okay, so the answer is idiopathic osteosclerosis. And the one point I didn't give that is going to lead you to you know, the, the correct answer, number, so idiopathic osteoporosis is the correct answer. It's not osteodysplasia or cemento osteodysplasia because that is the one that you're going to find that there's going to be a nice round uh, halo or a low density rim. And then around that will be slightly corticated. Uh, de definitely the very second uh, differential diagnosis, don't get me wrong. It's, you know, again, we, we can only give an answer to the information that we know. So it's idiopathic osteoporosis, Differential diagnosis, potentially osteodysplasia, odontoma. So 
The findings there also have a low density rim. Uh, the secondary finding regarding that, it's going to have um, mixed density within it. Um, you know, there's going to be some high density from the enamel. It's going to have some, you know, mixed density, low density from the dentin. Uh, again, low density rim. The osteoma, that's going to be, uh, uh, again, you know, very similar density, but it's going to be growing peripherally. It's going to be growing on the outside of the, the bone. The only time you'll find it inside is usually, and these are the top two findings, it's going to be either in the esphoid air cells or in the frontal sinus. Those are the most common findings. Yes, of course, you'll find it in the maxillary sinuses, but when you find these mushroom-shaped high densities, you'll usually see them ethmoid air cells and frontal sinuses. Cementoblastoma, that was the one hint I didn't give you. You know, uh, again, not a bad differential diagnosis, but it is not associated with the tooth. It looks very close to 28, but it's, it's, it's not connected. All right, good job. That was, that was really, really good. All right, another one. It's going to be the same list. There's a, a series of three lesions, if you want to call it, or abnormalities. All right, this one, same thing. Mixed density associated with the buccal uh, outlines. Um, the manipulative canal is definitely involved. Is it displaced? I don't know. Is it constricted? I, I can tell it is not. Not associated with the, the surrounding tissue. Here's some, if you're familiar with axial views, here's some nice axial views. So just as a, uh, a heads up, Dr. Morchad, on our end, it turns out every time I launch the poll, um, it does actually replace your screen. We're not able to show the answer choices in your screen at the same time. So what I'm kind of doing is, um, I think for the rest of the questions we have prepared in the slide, uh, if you could just kind of set the stage, um, give the different descriptions, uh, and give everybody uh, uh, some time to view the images, and then I'll kind of have, uh, I'll delay the launch of the poll. That way people can kind of, uh, you know, dissect your examples before it gets replaced by the poll choices. Fantastic. I like it. Okay, so we still have a couple answers floating in. So I'll give everyone a couple more seconds. Um, and, and, and I could see because it wasn't fair because looking at it that quickly, you're, you're correct because um, just looking at the answers now, most people did say osseous dysplasia. This was actually idiopathic osseous sclerosis. Uh, is there any way to stop the poll so they can see the, the presentation now? So the, the big giveaway on this one was, again, there's no, and I, I, and I apologize, you're, you're, you guys are right, there, you don't have enough time to, to look at the image before we moved on, but there was no low density rim again. Uh, this one, it looks mixed density, but if you look at each of the sections, it actually is all the same density. It's all cortical bone density. The only difference is in the center, it looks like a low density, but that is continuous with the rest of the um, trabecular bone pattern. There's no interruption of the cortical outlines. There's no expansion. There's no thinning. Those are findings that you're going to see in your osseous dysplasia. Um, again, idiopathic osseous sclerosis does not have to be round. It can be whatever shape it wants. Um, and so this one, again, and, and you know, th these are all findings. You know, of course, we're not going to get a biopsy of this to you know, find out what it is, but it is just dense bone in that, in that instance. And we do have a, a series of those images over a period of time to know that there was no change in that, in that density. Okay, so here's another question. So yes, let's not go to the poll yet. So on this one, there's a bunch going on. And I'll tell you, Andy, when, when to uh, go ahead with the poll, because uh, I got a few images here for everyone to review. So you can see number one, two, four, 16, um, you know, high densities, mixed density, um, multiple findings in the mandible, in the posterior mandible. This one is in the area of 10 and 11. And again, a, a high mixed density. And this one, again, I don't want to be giving away the answer, but here we go with a low density rim. There's some expansion of the cortical outlines. 
And here again, you can see in the area of number four, elevated elevation of the, men, uh, men, uh, the uh, floor of the maxillary sinus. The only finding I want to give you is one. So don't let this part trick you. All right, let's, let's put the poll on. Okay, so about 40 people, 40% 40 of people have voted. Um, so this one, and again, using the information we have, and I, again, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, some of these answers aren't wrong, are wrong, because they are great um, differential diagnosis. The answer was osseous dysplasia, and the type was florid. If you guys remember, it's the one where there's multiple uh, findings similar to that. Odontoma, uh, very possible. Again, you're not going to find that many, but you know, again, it's going to be low density, corticated, uh, you know, round osteoma. That one finding that we have uh, that was in the area of number four was a floor of the maxillary sinus, not mushroom shaped, but still possibly uh, osteoma. But overall, all the findings, the first differential, and that is these clues would have led us to uh, osseous dysplasia. Andy, is there a delay with uh, the presentation? No, I don't believe so. We're on the next slide now that you have. Okay, so you do see it. Okay, I wasn't sure if then there's a delay between the two. Okay, so uh, this one, this is not a poll. This one, I, you can type your answer in if you think you know what it might be. This is, as you can see, the cross uh, section is near the midline. Uh, mixed density lesion. It's not potentially not one of the ones that are on the list, but I just wanted to show you these interesting findings and the few little clues, and I talked about this last week, there's a few clues that are going to get you to the correct diagnosis. Again, you can still have a differential, but you'll say most likely not because of this versus most likely it is because of this. So this one, really cool, this is actually an inverted supernumerary tooth. And it's actually interrupting the floor of the maxillary sinus. Okay, here's the next poll question. I'm going to run this a few times. You know, I, if you're not that familiar with the uh, sagittal view, but it looks like there's a irregular, almost bone looking tube extending from superior to inferior. I'll run it one more time. And you know, I'm, I'm trying to do this so you guys have a good idea of the different views you can use and become more familiar when, you, when you're going through a volume to be able to have these findings without having you know, a perfect cross-section right along that tube, we should call it. All right, so let's run the, the poll on this one. And while everyone's answering the, um, the poll right now, Dr. Morcha, we did have a question. Uh, someone asked, is there any website or textbook resources that you would recommend to help with these kinds of exercises? There, there's quite a few. Um, our, I don't want to call it the Bible for radiology, but the main one we use is uh, White and Feral. White and Feral, as in, in like an Egyptian Feral, um, and white as in the color or the lack of color. And uh, that, that's the one we use. And that's the one we use really because that's the foundation for everything we have in part one and part two of our board exams. Uh, the only issue with that one is the first half is really designated to all the physics. And the second half is going to be all your 
uh, pathology and your interesting findings. Uh, it's nicely condensed, uh, which is great. The next textbook, which I would recommend, is one that's by Dr. Koenig, C-O-N-E-G, I believe. Um, again, it's Head and Neck uh, Pathology. And uh, that one, it's, you know, it's got to be at least two, three inches thick. It has everything in there, but it also summarizes a lot of information. Um, what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, I'm going to add just a simple one-page PDF um, that's going to, you know, kind of give you a summary. You know, if it's low density, these are the most common low densities. These are the most common high densities. Uh, the only thing is, there, there is no, you know, in these four hours of sessions, really, I'm trying to give you a really good foundation. You're not going to know everything. I, I went to, you know, technically, it's a two-and-a-half-year-old program. I did three because, you know, I did my master's uh, for radiology. Uh, but basically, you're never going to know everything. The only thing is, you know, you can get yourself to the correct area and then, you know, hey, it's a high density, it's kind of, you know, a, a low density rim, and then you can flip to that section of the textbook and kind of find the answer. But, you know, you're, you're not going to, again, this, I'm, I'm hoping everyone has a good foundation, but, uh, you know, and those are the two that I definitely recommend. I'm just looking here, what else I have? No, those are all anatomy. But yeah, White and Farrell and uh, Dr. Koenig, those two textbooks. And uh, what I'll do is next presentation, maybe I'll get the, an image uh, and put them in the PowerPoint so you can see exactly what the title is. All right, so 50% calcified stylo highway, excellent. That is what it is. Um, internal carotid artery calcification, very close. Um, you're definitely in the right ballpark because you know, of course that's gonna be running superior, inferior. Um, product gland duct, same area, um, thyroid cartilage, that's going to be a little inferior to your hyoid, but still, you know, these are all good differentials, but, you know, the slam dunk was the calcified stylohyoid ligament uh, calcification. And so now I'm going to show you that what I was talking about, the modified views to look right down the barrel of that calcification. So again, if you know your cone beam uh, CT, you can I definitely see it in the 3D, but that's going from the styloid hyoid, styloid process, sorry, to the uh, greater horn of the hyoid bone right there. And you can see the hyoid bone really well in that 3D image. Uh, another big finding when you see this, uh, it's gonna have that almost like a finger look, you know, uh, each, each of the joints of the finger. It's going to be usually not superly, uh, super uh, continuous. It's going to be segmented. And that's, those are big findings uh, for it. Uh, okay, so run the next poll. So the question is, what is the syndrome associated with this finding? And now that we know it's stylohyoid ligament calcification, what syndrome is associated with this finding? I'll wait until there's about 40%. You want to challenge yourself. And it, it looks like... So it looks like I can't trick most of you. So it is Eagle Syndrome. Um, the, I'll, I'll give you the other associated findings. So we actually have a coworker here that, you know, we took a scan. I, I'm going to say it was TMJ, you know, pain. And I did this reading. And uh, younger gentleman, I'm going to say, I think he's about 26. But, you know, fully calcified all the way from the, uh, just like this, and even worse, uh, but no other symptoms. So that is just a calcified stylohyoid ligament. Eagle syndrome is now when you have the associated pain or discomfort with turning your neck or, you know, sharp pain, spontaneous sharp pain in the neck. That's where, again, you know, you have, you have the multiple findings that's going to lead you to a syndrome. So it's your calcified stylohyoid. And so when you do find this, you know, you make note of it and you make sure you tell that patient, like, you know, just pay attention. Of course, if you tell a patient, pay attention to it, they're, they're always going to say there's pain. But, uh, um, you know, is there associated discomfort or pain associated with turning their neck? Okay, good job. That was great. 77%. Wow. Okay, another question. And we're doing okay for time. 
Um, round calcification, Andy, run the poll. All right, so that's about 30 seconds. I, I actually, there's a timer there, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, so almost everybody's totally correct. 78% say all of That is what it is. Um, location, big giveaway. Uh, that's going to be your uh, submandibular gland. You have the three main glands, submandibular, uh, lingual, and then your parotid. Um, this one, just, you know, being just medial to the inferior border of the mandible that that's a slam dunk cialis now management this is two ways either if the patient has a lot of pain when they're uh, about to eat as you know you know saliva is trying to go to mouth you know they're going to get a lot of pain uh, if they don't have pain not necessarily something you need to uh treat right away but follow up on sometimes if the patient just does something now that they know it's there massage the area may loosen it and it it in a lot of cases, it just comes out by itself, especially something that this size. You think this is huge. It, it is actually, you know, not that large compared to, you know, ones I, I have seen. Uh, when they do become severely painful, you know, associated with swelling, associated with, you know, discomfort, then that's something that they have to go to the next level and, and get it removed. Well, great job. 78%. Uh, for those who said tonsillitis, you're not far off. Uh, this is example, the most common is going to be the one on the top. Uh, that's your uh, palatine uh, tonsillus, and then you have your lingual, which is the one on the bottom. Of course, your lingual gland, and we're going to cover the glands uh, near the end, uh, but it's just going to be just superior to the epiglottis at the uh, posterior portion of the, uh, of the tongue. Uh, management for this, sometimes you'll see it, sometimes you won't. Again, it's about the severity of it and the patient's age. Um, if the patient, if you see a lot in a patient, you, you don't even have to see a lot, but if there is a lot, then the first thing you should ask is, hey, do you have recurrent you know, infections you know, uh, in the area? Number two, teletosis. That is the big giveaway. If they're constantly you know, struggling with smelly breath and they have a lot of uh, tonsillitis, that is usually uh, an indication of, of something that needs to be treated. All right, another question. So this one, tubular, I'm gonna tell you it's inferior to the, um, inferior to the, uh, the hyoid. You can see the cervical vertebrae, you can see all that calcification, it's around the airway. This one might not be as easy. All right, you can run the poll please. Okay, so 40% of people voted. Uh, we have 36% 36, 36 carotid artery, 14% omohyoid muscle calcification, 34% um, thyroid cartilage calcification, and then 15% sternohyoid muscle calcification. Okay, so I'm glad everyone was very close on this because uh, this is a really good question because, all right, so those who said muscle, you're not very far off. Okay. The big difference is those muscles attach to the superior, to the in, uh, anterior portion of the uh, hyoid, so they would have been on the other part of the, uh, the airway. But very good answers. That's very similar to what calcifications would look like. 
As you remember, the, the OMO highways moves more like an inverted V versus the sternal highways are going to be parallel and if they are calcified. Uh, carotid artery calcifications. Not far off, I didn't give enough slices for you to have the perfect answer on this, but I'm going to show you how we get to the perfect answer. All right, because those who said thyroid cartilage calcification, that is correct. And I'm going to show you here. So this is the, uh, the horns of your uh, hyoid bone. And so your thyroid cartilage is always going to be perfectly inferior to it. If it's slightly uh, lateral or you know, more towards the periphery and more distal, that's where you're going to have your uh, carotid artery calcifications. But this one was your uh, thyroid cartilage. And here's just so you, you have a little FYI and other findings. You know, what is this piece? You know, you're going to find this in some patients, you're going to find it in, in not in others, but that's your trichesis cartilage of the, um, it, it, I, I challenge you to search it. It's going to be very difficult to find. It's not in every patient, but it's the trichesis uh, cartilage of the uh, thyroid. And then this, of course, is your thyroid cartilage. All right. Right here, as you can see, the calcifications, this is going to be your uh, atheromas or your carotid artery calcifications. It's going to be posterior lateral to your airway. Here, this is intracranial, and you're going to see this quite often. But this is where you're going to see there's going to be calcification, and it's going to be lateral to the cella turcica. If you see something that's posterior to the cella turcica, that's not the same thing, because that's, that's going to be your, your clenoid, uh, Petroclenoid calcification ligament, that's a ligament. It has to be perfectly lateral to your cella turcica. And again, in the axial, you know, around C3, C4, that's going to be your carotid bulb. That's most likely where you're going to see the calcifications, and it's going to posterior lateral to the airway. Here's a perfect example of what atheroma looks like in a coronal view. This is going to be your slam dunk. When you, once you see this, look how perfectly round that is. You know, that's, that's part of your, your uh, circle of Willis. And that, that's atheromas right there. Other interesting findings you'll see in a lot of patients, a lot, a lot of patients, uh, is going to be this. This is your uh, pineal gland calcifications. And that's always going to be the midline. And I want to show a little difference in this one. If anyone knows what this is, type it in. I'll just, just for a few seconds. This is a very, very difficult one. I didn't want to make this a quiz because it's, it, it's, very rare. I've, I've seen maybe two of these in a thousand. But when you see it, it's, it's very apparent. A few people want to type in a few answers here. Any, any responses? We have pituitary gland calcification. Okay, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. It's, it's too anterior, too superior, but very good guess because you're, you're in the ballpark. Um, again, this is a part of anatomy that we're not taught, of course, I, I you know, barely taught in dental school and barely taught even in, in radiology. Of course, we didn't even know, know what it was. Rare findings, this is your Falx cerebi or Falx uh, cerebelli, uh, but it's F-A-L-X uh, cerebelli, and it's just basically that midline ligament that runs you know, through the midline. And so you're going to see it here most often, but you know, if you do see it like more the, the midline at the, the superior portion of your skull, don't be surprised, but it's always going to be right at your mid sagittal view. Okay, we only have a few more quizzes and I didn't realize we we're going to be running so long. I apologize. Um, I want to get through these. So let's, let's talk about the maxillary sinuses and the nasal cavity. Okay, so here we go. So can you run the poll? So soft tissue thickening in the maxillary sinuses. Let's take a look here. Okay, it's about 40% of votes. So we got 30% mucositis, 36% mucus retention pseudocysts, 
31% sinusitis. All right, so a little bit of a trick question. It was not mucus retention pseudocyst. I'm going to show you one. So the big giveaway for mucus retention pseudocyst, it's going to be dome shaped. It's always going to have this nice round dome shape. That's the biggest one. Uh, and normally it's going to have that view in your, as you can see here in your uh, coronal views. Sinusitis versus mucositis. That's, it's, honestly, it's, it's very, very subjective. They're almost interchangeable, but they're almost not. And I'm saying subjective is because that top image, I'm going to call that generalized mucositis, okay? I, I'll even say in the, the lower images, I'm going to say uh, mild, or sorry, moderate uh, uh, mucositis. The second I go sinusitis, it's something that I'm, you know, I'm thinking that there's something that you need to take care of here. Uh, care of here. And those are going to be when you have something that's acute or looks active or something that's chronic. And let me show you an example of the chronic and active. So right here, as you can see, if you have what's called air inclusions, and you can see in, in the sphenoid sinus, you can kind of see, I hope you know the, the image isn't too dark, but you can see it's kind of wispy and looks like there's little bubbles within it. This is normally what's considered an active, it, it, you guys think about it, like the, the mucus and the sinusitis, it's, it's almost like bubbling up. Uh, and then you can see in the, the wall of the maxillary sinus there, those little air inclusions. This is going to be something that's active and acute. So the patient most likely is going to have some kind of pain associated with it. Right here, this is the only example I'm going to show you, but this is that dome-shaped look. That's most likely a mucositis, a mucus retention pseudocyst. Now, the reason I'm showing this one, this one specifically, because this one, you cannot rule out a polyp. Just because of its shape and its location, a polyp is normally going to be on that medial wall and it's going to have that little dangle look. But again, I'm not saying it is. Most likely, most, most likely that is just a mucus retention pseudocyst. But in this case, and, and very rarely are you going to see this, you can't rule out that polyp. Here is an example. Question, Dr. Of, Morchat. Yes, absolutely. Um, a doctor is asking, when would you recommend consultation by an ENT when you see thickening of the sinuses? Okay, okay, and so it would have to be absolutely severe and the patient's in a lot of pain and it's not being resolved with, um, you know, the simple uh, over-the-counter medication. Um, you know, if, if the patient is already, you know, on allergy medication and they, again, you know, they, they know that they get chronic sinusitis and, and uh, they're, they're still getting pain, Yes, you know, get their hand and bring them to an ENT because they might not know that there's a lot of options out there to relieve that pressure, relieve that pain. A great question, thank you. And in this case, this is absolutely when you want to refer to an ENT. Uh, if you see this, this patient's had this issue for a long, long time, and I am surprised that they're not in so much pain that they haven't already had surgery. Surgery. Right away, I'm telling you, they're just going to go through it, it and it's outpatient. You'd be surprised. People with chronic sinusitis, um, you know, why, why struggle with taking medication all the time? I, I know a lot of friends that have had this done. It was outpatient surgery. They go in there, they break that wall between your nasal cavity and your maxillary sinus, and you immediately get relief. Here's chronic sinusitis. Biggest giveaway for chronic sinusitis is look at the left side and how thin and corticated that, that wall, that, that, you know, superior and lateral wall of the sinuses versus the right side. Look how thick, sclerotic, it, it looks nasty. It looks like it's, it's, it's kind of got even smaller, um, you know, right there. And then the second thing is look at all that junk inside of it. This is very, very, very long standing. For something, you gotta imagine, like you'd be surprised like a periapical lesion or periapical cyst can get calcification within it, but that lesion has to be there for such a long time that, you know, it, that it, it's reacting on its own. And so this is an example where uh, the sinus is actually reacted and it, it starts calcifying within. Uh, great example of antral lifts. So I'm going to tell you, not even a story, but this patient was not that old, has all these antral lifts on the floor of the maxillary sinus and it was bilateral, um, never had a sinus problem. And so that's why they always say that it's not, these antral lifts are not always associated with chronic sinusitis or previous chronic sinusitis. Patient had no surgery, no, he never, you know, had to remember having sinusitis, um, uh, and, and he still has these. So when you do see these, it doesn't necessarily mean for sure, you know, a lot of cases they are idiopathic, uh, but, uh, you know, chronic sinusitis is usually most likely, but not always. All right, 
Let me give you a few images here. So this is a great one. Right away, I'm going to tell you that right sinus. There's something going on there. Look at it. Really thickening of the, of the, the outline. And I, I know we, we're, I don't, we don't have a lot of time and I really want to cover what we have left. But, you know, sinus is completely shrunken, almost completely opacified. And this should be the giveaway. And I'm not going to describe it. This should just give it away. All right, can you run the poll, please? Okay, we're at about 30%. So 20% uh, fibrous dysplasia, 20% silent sinus syndrome, 9% osseous fibroma, 50, 51% blow up fracture. So I would say absolutely yes, blow up fracture if you only saw the patient clinically and you saw the one uh, eye lower than the other. A lot of people don't know of this disease and it does exist a lot. If the osseomedial complex is occluded, and we don't know why. Again, this is a syndrome, so you don't, there's multiple reasons why this might happen. The patient might have a polyp, mucosil, uh, just severe sinusitis, and that's why this patient most likely, the leading case was severe sinusitis. The sinus and the, the, the superior border of the sinus is going to collapse on itself, and it's actually called silent sinus syndrome, and it is not as uncommon as you think. A per person that has been struggling with long-standing severe sinusitis and does not bother getting it treated, this happens. There's two things going to happen. Either it's just going to get sclerotic and they're going to constantly be on medication, or if they're just trying to deal with it themselves, they, the, the whole sinus itself just collapses on itself. And the eye will fall, the cheek will uh, uh, be uh, concave, and it's, look, look it up. It is shocking. And we see cases like this, you know, often when it comes to sinus issues or airway issues. Really wanted to cover this. All right, severe sinusitis on the right side, or sorry, moderate sinusitis, possibly active but acute because you see those air inclusions, but those are the only two air inclusions that we see. So, you know, this might be the way the patient was in the, 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 uh, the, the, the device, the machine. The big one I want to show you here, when you see something like this and it's not bilateral, it's unilateral, you look at each of the apices of the canals. In this case, we got number four that looks like there's, you know, an infection or something. But if you look at that apex, we can see the floor of the maxillary sinus is completely continuous. So this is non-odontogenic. And that's always the giveaway when you see, you know, unilateral sinus infection. Uh, patients just, you know, spontaneously complains about it. You see number four. You think number four is the cause. Um, but no, in this case, this is non-odontogenic. These are all the possible findings that you might see um, in the temporal mandibular joints. You know, I'm not going to, of course, get into it. I added this to the handout so you can, you know, review it. A lot of this you don't even need to know. The development of abnormalities, not issues. Bifid condyles, see it quite often. Soft tissue, uh, the disc, don't necessarily know what the soft uh, tissue disc is doing on a cone beam CT. It's going to be MRI where you see what's going on with it. Uh, remodeling, EJD, uh, remodeling might not be an issue. Uh, but let's say we have two patients, patients 28 years, uh, 26 years old, young female, severe remodeling or moderate remodeling. This is something you might be concerned with versus a 70 year old that has moderate remodeling. They, they've lived 70 years, you know, no shock that they have some remodeling of their condyle. Um, articular loose bodies, very, very rare. Something not even to be concerned about. This is a case where the left condyle, there's some remodeling here. Uh, you can see there's a loss of volume, a little bit of osteophyte formation, but, you know, again, something to be followed up with, not necessarily something to, uh, to refer or be concerned of, but again, to, to really, you know, watch the patient, ask them what their symptoms, uh, and, and make sure you follow up with them. On this case, now we have severe sclerosis. Not a lot of osteophyte formation, but the big giveaway on that left superior portion of the condyle, that also, that missing portion of the, the uh, cortical outline, that is a subchondral cyst. Subchondral cyst. Um, then we have here, um, just another example. This one, patient may or may not have pain. I actually don't remember exactly, but the point of this one was 
you know, this, this, this is soft tissue issue. You know, this is something that the, the, the cone beam CT can tell you, look at the bone reaction. You know, there, there's a sclerosis, a little bit of ossified formation, you know, but is this active? Well, heck yeah, it's active. Even without a subchondral cyst, the biggest giveaway on this one is there is, look at that, where's the space for the, the, uh, the joint? This is bone on bone, basically. So this is something, you know, with or without pain may, may want a referral because this is just going to get worse in this case. So when I'm describing, I gave this with a handout, so I'm going to you know, go through it pretty quickly. But when you're describing uh, the bony structures and decide if it's something that's a remodeling uh, versus something that's something to act on, number one, you're looking at the condylar head, the shape, size, bilaterally, the same thing. What does the mandibular fossa look like? Um, that's where the, the joint goes into. Articular eminence. If you remember, that's the, the part it articulates on, you know. Um, the articular space in open, rest, closed, these are all the things you want to use uh, for investigative work if the patient is complaining of pain or if you find this in a volume. Very similar, uh, cervical vertebrae has the exact same structures. It's got discs, it's got articular spaces, so you're looking for the exact same two things, sclerosis, you're looking for um, subchondral cysts, sorry, yes, of course, subchondral cysts and osteophyte formation. And osteophyte formation is, Sorry that I didn't describe it. It's when a bony speculum start growing off of the bone. I'm not saying free bodies. I'm talking about it's slowly pushing outwards. And as you can see on the coronal view of the cervical vertebrae, it's not perfectly vertical. There's between each joint, there's bone being grown. And that's what's the osteophyte formation. Sorry that if I didn't describe it earlier. Airway, and if you guys have the time, I know that's, that's we're right at two, uh, but I only have about three more slides. Just want to cover airway really quick. Very hot topic. Uh, this one, as you can tell, uh, you know, severe uh, generalized constriction of the airway. Tongue might be a little bit posterior, but that's not going to affect at all that this is, this is generalized severe uh, cervical, uh, this is generalized uh, constricted airway. Now, this person has enlarged tonsils, but surprise, it's a younger patient. Anyone under the age of 15 with enlarged tonsils is most likely going to be normal. I just want to point out, this is what the adenoids are. A lot of people think the adenoids are the palatine tonsils. It's not. It's the pharyngeal tonsils are the adenoids. These are your palatine. This is the ones that you, when you open your mouth, you can see are enlarged or not. And then your lingual is going to be the, the posterior part of your, of your tongue. These are the main ones. There's one other one, but it's you know, rarely ever seen. Example of this is, this is what you're going to see in the axial view if you have enlarged uh, palatine tonsils. So the ones when you open your mouth, you can see. And this one, a little bonus, you got you know calcification here, but you're going to have that uh, convexity of the tonsils pushing into the airway. So if you guys want to do a quick guess, the second last slide. Um, if you want to guess what tonsils enlarged here, this patient came in. Obstructed airway, I'm not saying CPAP's not gonna help, but the issue with this patient was actually just an enlarged lingual tonsil, and that's why they had difficulty breathing. Okay, last question, and this is bonus round. This is really just a segue into next week of, you know, kind of pathologies that we might see, um, abnormalities that we're gonna see that is really, when you see it in a volume, you're gonna be like, what the heck? So. Uh, I'll give two seconds here so you can look at it. And Andy, if you run, run that, um, the last uh, poll, because I know some of you guys probably have things to do, and this is supposed to be an hour CE. Um, but this is the last one we're going to move on after this, and we're just going to do our closing. Well, if, if you want to ask a few questions, feel free. after this poll, but if you want to add those questions just to your, um, the questionnaire at the end of the presentation, uh, you know, I, I can get back to you, especially after this presentation. I knew I was going to have a lot of material. I just really apologize that we're running a little later than we thought. All right. Periosteal reaction due to 28. Interesting. So I put that in there because that's what I thought it was as well. Um, 
Okay, so only 14% said the metformin, 43% said uh, periosteal reaction. Periosteal reaction, if you don't know, is when uh, there's an infection and the bone basically does what you see here. Uh, and it's going to have that, most of the time, that onion-shaped look. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma, again, because it's going to have the onion-shaped look or uh, periosteal reaction. Hemangioma, uh, potentially, I just threw that one in there. It actually is metformin, and it was a, kind of a trick question. This is actually cosmetic uh, filler material. This was a, a chin implant. We, we actually had uh, two correct guesses for the chin implant, so that was very interesting. <laughs> <They're> fantastic. 